Hello, Brains. How are you? Have you ever been in love? <laughs> Have you ever been strangled by love? Really? Have you been deceived by love? Have you lost your way because of love? Well, we have an expert here. Uh, our guest today is Fiona Elkersley from Connecticut with a beautiful English accent. That's her next to me. And we're gonna be talking about the subject of divorce. Yes, the big D. Now, I don't know what that tastes like, but I have seen a lot of people go through it. And I have some very interesting questions for uh, Fiona today. I wanna know what it's like. I wanna know what uh, impact it has on the family. I wanna know what um, signs there were that maybe she ignored or that she didn't see. But then I also wanna ask her, how does she rebound? How does she get her sexy back, okay? Look at her. Okay, she's absolutely striking. So Brains, help me welcome to the show today, our guest, Fiona Elkersley. Hi, Hi. thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you. My brains are ready for this because everybody's been strangled by love at one point or another. I love that. I tell you, you're going through it and I'm like, oh yeah, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. But then we're also going to talk about the yeses on the other side because, you know, I heard getting back out there can be a challenge, but you're going to walk us through the process. So tell us a little bit about your story. Um, so, as you noted, I have an English accent. I'm actually from, from the north of England, originally. Um, how to end up in Connecticut, right? So, I grew up in a kind of chaotic family, but I managed to be the first person in my family to, still even, to go to college uh, as a teacher. And I decided afterwards to go work as a volunteer in Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa. Ooh. And that's where I met my future husband, who was in the Peace Corps. Um, so long story short, I'm, I got a job in New York after that and cause he's from Connecticut and, uh, five years later, you know, we got, after I met him, we were married and 17 years later after that, four kids, suburban life, country club, stay at home mom, you know, essentially like the perfect life, right? Right. Everything, everything was lovely. Everything was rosy. Um, of course, it wasn't, looking back. But at the time, I was just going through. I had four kids. I was looking after them. I was doing what I needed to do and, you know, getting on with my life. And <clears throat> basically, uh, very long story short, he was always a little bit moody. Like, I was always in trouble for something. You know, I'd always said something or done something. Mm -hmm. So he'd been a little moody for a couple of weeks. And um, it was about, it was about, two weeks after our uh, 17th wedding anniversary. And he walked in the room one Sunday afternoon and he said, uh, I need to tell you something. And I was like, okay, good. Now I'm going to find out what I did wrong. Right. right. <laughs> so I can fix it. And he said, uh, I don't love you anymore. And I'm filing for divorce. Yikes. Yeah. And that was literally the first indication that I realized <laughs> the first indication I knew that we had a problem in our marriage. Um, and as you can imagine, that was kind of flabbergasting. Like I, I, um, I was speechless, which is unusual for me, but I just didn't know it. And he, um, you know, so I was like, what? <laughs> like, why? What's going on? Um, and literally then my youngest daughter, who was eight, walks in the room and I had to pretend everything was okay. Cause what do you, you know, what am I going to do? And this, that situation went on for three weeks in the house where I had to pretend that I, that nothing was going on, that everything was okay because my kids didn't know. He had told me that I wasn't allowed to tell anybody. Allow, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of that deal. And, um, and, and I was like thinking that we could fix this, that this was some weird thing that was gonna fix, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I was even, I was, I actually just gone back to work at the time as part-time as a teacher, as a substitute. Mm -hmm. And I would open my handbag every morning. I'd go in there and there's like all these little boys sitting in there. It was a boys school, first grade. I'd open my bag and he'd shoved all these brochures into my bag about collaborative divorce. Wow. And then I'm supposed to get on with my day, right? Um, so it was, yeah, it was very traumatic. It was very upsetting. And I was devastated because I had no idea 
okay, now let me dial back here, okay? Yeah. Because uh, I know that you were a mother of four. Yeah. I know that you were a mother of four, okay? And that's a big distraction. But how could you be in a marriage and not see any signs of, you know, discord? It's not a good question. <laughs> and that's one of the problems that, I, that, that was killing me because I'm like, if I didn't see this, what is wrong with me? Right. But it was, we never really fully communicated. I mean, I had also, when you look right back on it, I mean, I'd never had an example of a healthy relationship. I was was, was going to ask you that too. You know, I grew up in a a, a very abusive alcoholic um, household um, where, you know, I didn't have a good, you walked in my house and it was like, there was tension that you could literally cut with a knife. So I didn't, I, and you know, nobody wanted to confront anybody. I was the only person that was kind of the disruptor as it were, um, which I paid for by the things that I was called. So I didn't really know what a healthy relationship was. So I'm with this guy who, you know, and he's not a bad person. I don't want to like put out there that he's evil or anything, but, but he was very controlling. He has his own issues, right? But to me, it's like, it it was, well, he's not hitting me. He's not doing anything bad to me. So it must be okay. You know, my bar was really low. Well, that verbal abuse is brutal. Yes, there was, there was, it it was, it was verbal-ish, but it was more emotionally controlling, you know, emotional controlling, financial controlling, um, discounting of my ideas. Like I know nothing, that type of thing. Um, but the, when looking back, we, and we had zero good communication because I didn't want to cause a fight, right? Because I didn't want to have that tension in my household. Absolutely. And he had grown up in, in this New England, um, everything is perfect and, and I'm not going to get upset. You should know what I'm thinking. Well, okay. So you didn't know what he was thinking. And you're looking at yourself, and again, you're you're living there in the household. You are a stay-at-home mom. Um, did you have any aspirations and dreams for yourself outside of being a mom? I mean, did you? Did you oh go yeah. To well, you want to be? Yeah. So teaching, you know, teaching was my passion, but it was it was not going to happen whilst I was home with the kids because what I was earning was not worth, you know, it wasn't a good payoff, right? Right, To pay for somebody else to look after my kids. So I did actually start a couple of businesses. I, um, I was a painter and I painted children's furniture and bedrooms. And through that, I ended up making these handbags, which were kind of unique and interesting. And I was selling those. And I also taught art classes out of my house. And as well as looking after the four kids and the whole house and painting my house and doing everything, right? And it was going pretty well, but it was always, he, I wasn't allowed to discuss it. He didn't like it. Um, You know, there was one famous time when it came time for taxes and I said, oh, I wrote everything down that I made. You're going to the accountant. Can you take it? And he said, no, I'm not taking it. And I said, why not? And he said, that's your, that's your, that's your stuff. You deal with it. And I said, yeah, but we file jointly and you're on your way to the accountant. Right, 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 right. No. And so it was like a refusal. It was like a refusal to acknowledge that I was doing anything. And I I, I came to understand later that it was because I was spending too much time doing that and I wasn't paying attention to him. Although I did it, he wasn't even around when I did it, right? Okay, so let me me fast forward a little bit. How was intimacy? I, it was good. I mean, I didn't really, who knows? It seemed good to me. I mean, it was, it was on a regular basis. We had four children. It, was, it wasn't slackening off right until the end. It was kind of, I think, I think that it was okay. I think to maybe towards the end, you know, it was less, less often than maybe he would have liked. But again, it was more for the fact that four kids kept walking in the room all the time. Right. You know, it's that type of thing. The other thing that happened, which looking back on is, is so understandable now, is that for three years before he, he announced, made this announcement, I was extremely ill. Mm. I had um, really bad stomach issues that um, I was, I had multiple endoscopies, colonoscopies. Mm. Um, they said, oh, you know, you may have some kind of autoimmune disease. You may have multiple sclerosis. You may have this, that, and the other. They tested me. They put me on all kinds of pills, which made me really 
weird, which I didn't like. So I went off those immediately after, after a month. Um, so, and so I was literally going to bed at eight 30 when the kids went to bed because I was just exhausted. Like I couldn't function. So I'm sure that that had something to do with it. But the bottom line is, is that I finally got off the pills, went to a nutritionist who changed, radically changed my diet. She said, your, your insides are all inflamed and blah, blah, blah. That was, that was what was wrong with me. It wasn't what caused it. Right. Well, the he thing left, is, is I got better. <laughs> Yeah, but your marriage vows say in sickness and in health. Right. Really? But the point, if the thing is, is that he was actually, I, my living with him, the tension in our house was actually what was making me sick, but I didn't wow. even, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, when I was talking to the nutritionist, I mean, this is literally six months before he left. She, she was asking me questions and she's like, oh, scale one to 10, how's your marriage? Mm. And I said, Oh, I think it's an eight, but don't tell him because he probably thinks it's a 10, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah, turns out it was a one. <laughs> but um, so that's how clueless I was. That I was just living my life, looking after my kids, trying to, you know, trying to get through. Well, again, you did not have the best example no. of what love is. Now, I've been married to Mr. Magnificent for 35 years. And as of this morning when he left, we still adore one another. But I'm always paying attention. Believe me, I'm not sleeping. I don't have friends hanging around my relationship. I don't consult them. I don't tell them good, bad, or indifferent. I have my own money, uh, and I collaborate with him. I talk to him. I will pick up his cell phone bill, and I will pick up his cell phone. I'll go in his wallet, all of that kind of stuff. And he has the right to do that to me. Because you don't know what is going on in somebody else's mind. Right. You don't know what's going on in their heart. Matter of fact, you don't even know what's going on on folks' computer because they're addicted to this porn and they're having all these relationships. And one day you look on Facebook and your husband or wife is canoodling with somebody else. So you need to pay attention in relationships, brains. You really, really do. You need communication. To and communication, communication is key. key. If you're not happy, Talk to that person. See if you can get some counseling. See if you can go for a nice walk. If you're seeing someone that is distant from you, that is, you know, not, uh, you know, coming home at a regular time or not answering your phone calls or not paying attention to the kids. I mean, there's a lot of signs and I know that we don't want to recognize them. But the best thing that you can do is if the situation is not working, don't strangle somebody with your love, <laughs> okay? Set them free. So what you have learned from all of this is what, Fiona? Well, I think uh, following on from what you just said, if you're in a relationship, the best thing to do is if you think that you're gonna say something, that may cause conflict or it may, you know, you need to speak up anyway, because, right. because not causing the conflict can actually make it worse. Right. It, it's going to, if it's going to be an issue, it's going to be an issue. So just get it out there and get it out the way and discuss it. That, that would be the main takeaway from that part. But what I learned was, um, Myself as a person, I was, I was equally complicit in this relationship not working out because I was not in a good place personally. I did not feel my own self-worth. I was not able to believe that I could do whatever I wanted, mm -hmm. right? So I was with this person who I might not have think was treating me the best way, but hey, that seems normal to me. Well, that's so, all part of the control, you know, and if they already know that you come from a very vulnerable background, I mean, that's just the gateway. And hurt right. people, hurt and, people. Hurt people, hurt yeah, people. Yeah, I don't think, and, and this is what I was saying to one of my clients, that I don't think that the men who do this are necessarily evil, dreadful, horrible. You know, it's their own issues that they bring to the relationship. Like, here's my issues, here's his issues. Oh, look, they fit together perfectly, right? And that's the problem. And once you, what I, you know, what I do with my clients is once you can fix the issues that you have, you work on yourself, mm -hmm. you figure out the story of who you truly are, not what you've been told since you were seven and all these things coming in your head, right? Once you can fix that, that, those people who come along, it doesn't fit anymore. So that you're not going to attract those people anymore. You're going to attract someone who is worthy of your attention. 
All right. right? So you're at this point and you have consciously or unconsciously uncoupled and you've divorced. And you look at yourself in the mirror and you stand right. there butt naked. You're vulnerable. You don't know who you are. Your money is funny. You still got four kids. You don't feel attractive. You don't, you know, you're afraid of love. How do you start to work on getting your mojo back after you've concluded the divorce? Right. Well, it took me quite a long time. It was quite a long journey for me, which is why I want to work with other people to stop that part of it for them. Um, I really, basically everything that you can mess up after divorce, I did it. You know, too much drinking, too much eating, too much shopping, jumping right back into another relationship to validate myself. Because like you said, you don't feel attractive. You have no sense of who you are anymore. And it's like, what am I going to do? And the problem with that is you end up almost 99% of the time, you're going to end up in the same relationship or worse than the one you had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I say I, the first guy that I, I went, serious man that I went out with after my divorce, I can tell you for sure, after two weeks, if he was one of my friend's boyfriends, there were so many red flags, I would have told him to run for the hills. Mm. But we don't do that for ourselves. We make excuses because we just want that. We want that situation right back because we're still so focused on, you know, what is life supposed to be? Um, so, so I really got to a low point. Finally, I managed to get rid of him. Finally, um, I was still going through some stuff with my ex-husband um, in court. I ended up with no job and no focus. And I was like, I woke up one morning and I had that like, you know, that feeling in the pit of my stomach, like what, this is not going to work. And the funny thing is, and this is what other women, is that I've always been like the strong one in my family and in my friends. And so literally women would say to me, my friends would like, oh my God, Fiona, you're so amazing. Mm. How do you do all this? How are you still coping? How are you carrying on? But the thing is, they didn't know like I was a complete mess. Mm. Like I literally would have, I'd be driving my kids around and I'd suddenly have this, like, I couldn't breathe. Like I'd be having a panic attack. I didn't realize that at the time, but that's what it was, you know? And it was when I was always thinking about what's coming next. What am I going to do? Um, so I was at that point and, and then I woke up this one morning and I was like this, I can't do this anymore. I can't, it's, it, it's a mess. And I ended up <clears throat> reaching out myself. For help which is not my strong point but I, re I reached out and I, I got myself a coach of my own to help me and fast forward I ended up doing my own coaching um, certification and through all of that I came to learn all these other ways of living your life right other right. things that I never believed in spiritual things like I was so against all that stuff Right? right. And I learned through my studies and doing all of this that, you know, it's not just for those old ladies in the woolly socks and the sandals. Like there's, there's right. real stuff. Right. This is some real stuff. It is real stuff. And it how really would. Your, how did this impact your children? You know, because we have this conversation and so many times people say, oh, well, the kids didn't know what's going on. Well, brains, newsflash. They know everything that's going on. They hear well, everything, they see everything. You can't hide from them. And also what they do is they use your relationship as a template oh, yeah. for their relationships moving forward, how yeah. they're going to deal with a partner, how they're going to deal with adversity, how they're going to raise a family, all of these things. And especially as women, you know, my mother bless her heart. I grew up with a stepfather, but he stepped right on in and did a great job. No problem. But my mother was always there and she always taught me to be a strong woman, to be independent, to understand my sexuality, to understand my self-worth. And I looked at her as a role model, you know? And so that's what these young women are looking to their mothers for as a role model. Mama, I, I see what you're doing. I see what you went through and either I want to do that or I don't want to do that. How did this impact your children? Yeah, exactly. So I was not being a good role model, for sure. I mean, I, and I definitely hadn't had any good role models in my life. Mm. Um, you know, and it came out in the way that my son used to speak to me, which was the same way his father used to speak to me. Right. It came out in um, 
my oldest daughter was once at my house with her boyfriend you know she was at college at the time and he said something to her and it was really derogatory and this is a girl who doesn't take any anything right from anybody right and she never even reacted and I was like, oh my God, like she didn't even notice that he just said that to her. And I, I did pull her aside later to talk about it. But what happened initially was my kids really didn't know. We never argued in the family. Like we, we didn't fight. And that was part of the problem, I think. Well, but it's not necessarily, kids, ar- you know, it's not necessarily arguing. It doesn't have to be verbal. They feel right. the energy. They see the separation. They well, they, they had no idea. Right. I had no idea. They had no idea. So this they were. Um, how old were they? 15, 13, 11 and eight at the time. And their dad literally sat them down and said them thinking we have a happy family, literally sat them down and said, yeah, your mother and I are not getting on. So I'm leaving. We're getting a divorce. Wow. That's how he told them. That's how he told them. Yeah. Now, my two older children um, actually do have some mental health issues, uh, anxiety, that type of thing, like really bad, you know. And so those two, and I think being their age too, it really impacted them heavily. And they, they did some pretty s- stupid things. Like it, it really made a difference in their lives. My daughter got herself back on track. She's, she's amazing. She went off to college. She got herself a therapist. She's, you know, she is taken off and she's doing great. She's 25 now. Um, my son, uh, did not get himself back on track. He has a very bad relationship with his father, very conflicted. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his went down to the level of addiction. He's a, he's a heroin addict. And he um, is still struggling with that, right? Thank God right now he's, he's in recovery. But, you know, it's a struggle. Every day is a struggle. And I, something would happen. He had his issues. But I think that the way it all went down did not help to push him in, in that direction. You know, your your ex-husband has to look at himself in the mirror. He may not want to uh, agree, uh, you know, with it, uh, but he has to look at himself in the mirror and say, how did I contribute to this? And what is my underlying pain? Because I don't think that he just woke up one morning with a wild hair up his ass and said, you know what? I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to leave, you know, all this. There's something that caused that. And I hope, I hope one day that he realizes that and that, you know, he can re-engage with his children because there's always an opportunity to redeem yourself. Talking about right. redemption. Okay, so now you're single. You're out there. You've got these four kids. You know, so many women don't know how to get their sexy back. <laughs> and I really, I did a whole show on that with a sex expert, okay? They don't know how to flirt. They don't know how to get a new haircut, get a new lipstick, you know, put your shoulders back, your breasts out, your stomach in. They don't know any of that anymore. They're going to this online dating. I did another great show. One of my guests was catfished out of $400,000, almost a half a million dollars with online dating. I'm not doing no online dating if I'm single. I need to see you, touch you, sniff you. I want to know your mama's name, everything. How do women go back out there and try to re-engage and reconnect and just find companionship, not necessarily a husband again, but just to, you know, have their sexy back and feel attractive? Well, honestly, the sexiest thing is confidence. Because if you believe in yourself and you have a view of your self-worth, then you can flirt and you can look good and you can make an effort. Um, if you're feeling down and you're, you know, you'd rather sit on the couch with, uh, with Netflix and a bag of chips, mm. you are not going to be projecting out there that I'm someone that's, you know, fun and flirty and having a good time. Right. And so, so literally every, that's why I call myself a confidence coach because literally everything in your life, Right. whether it's dating or your job or, or even, you know, getting on with coworkers, it's got to do with the confidence and the belief in yourself. So if you look in the mirror and the self-talk, the self-talk is the worst, right? If right. you're looking in the mirror and you're like, Oh God, I look so ugly. You're not, you're not thinking like, Oh, I'll get to new haircuts and then I'll look beautiful. You're just thinking I'm always going to look ugly. What's the point? Right. And right. it's a downward spiral. It just keeps going down. So that's really how you get your sexy back. You have to eliminate that self-talk. You have to look at what you're believing about yourself and become aware of what you're saying to yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you have to really just bust that myth and say, well, okay, is that actually true? 
you know right. is that really yeah. true that, that this is me and this oh where'd the idea come from and then and then but i did this look at what you really accomplished in your life mm -hmm. and then start to focus on the positive and honestly the biggest thing for me is the gratitude in every day every day if you can wake up and say and find something in your life that you're grateful for and it it doesn't even have to be a huge thing. Like I live in a big house or I have a great job, right? I, I, you know, I've said to people like, he's a lot better now, but I have an older dog. <clears throat> Some days the biggest gratitude I've got is great. Jackson didn't pee on the floor today, right? <laughs> it's okay. You can be grateful right. for anything. Anything, anything. And you know what? I, again, like you said, it's the confidence, but also having dreams and having goals and aspirations yeah. and knowing that life is not a stop sign. It's not a period. It's a comma. It's a, uh, there's quotations. There's questions. Continue to live your life. Life is not contingent on one person. You can begin again. And the easier that you make it on yourself and that other person to consciously uncouple, believe me, brains, I don't want nobody that doesn't want me. Okay. It's not going to work that way. You can't force someone to love you. You can't force someone to stay. So you have to find the love within yourself. And also you can find it within the pages of Fiona's book, Fearless to Fabulous, Unlock the Power, Move On, Thrive After Midlife Divorce. You know, it's an opportunity to win. Tell us what's inside the pages of your book and why you decided to write it. Okay, so I decided to write it because I've been, I talk to a lot of women um, every day on the phone and, you know, around me, where I live. And I was like, there's got to be a way, <laughs> I can't talk to everybody, right? right. So there's got to be a way to get this out. And, and so what I did was through my practice with talking to her, because when I started, I thought I knew what women wanted, but the more I talked to her, I realized, oh, this is what they really need, right? Yeah. And I, I, I sort of boiled it down to seven basic steps. And the seven steps are in my book, okay? So, so essentially, it's stop focusing on your ex, you know, stop stalking him on Facebook, stop being attached to him. Stop thinking, this is what my, no, my life was supposed to be this, right? Stop focusing on the past, because your life is supposed to be what your life is. Mm -hmm. There's no supposed to be, it's what you're living right now. That's what you're supposed to be. You know, face your financial realities, because it's always going to change, no matter what your situation is to start with. You're gonna have a little bit of a bump in the road there. Um, eliminate those bad habits that are really making you feel good short term, really short term, but then afterwards you, you're like hate yourself, right? You just ate, a in my case, I just ate a bag of cookies. Oh, now, oh my God, now you hate yourself, right? right. So it doesn't help for that long. Um, reframe your emotions. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of um, hate. There's a lot of nasty stuff goes along with being divorced, whether it's focused at him or you or both of you. You might not even realize a lot of it is at, is at yourself. So you need to reframe those emotions and really forgiveness is the key there. Um, you need to discover, I call it that inner bitch voice. It doesn't say that in the book because I wasn't allowed to write that in the book, but that's what I put originally. Discover that inner bitch. Every time she says something mean to you, Think about that. Really, would you say that to somebody else? Right. Probably not, right? Um, think about all of the new relationship dynamics that you're going to have to go through. It's not just your ex-husband or your ex-family. It could be your kids. It could be your friends. It could even be your own family, right? All of those things are going to change. So you need to, to look at those and figure out what you want to keep and what you need to get rid of because some of them are very toxic. And really, once you've got all of that done and you've got that confidence inside you and you're starting to build up that self-worth again, that's the time when you can really know, what are my goals? What do I want to do with my life? What are my passions, right? And once you've got that, then you can start to create a path to get where you really want to go. And so that's essentially what the book is. It, it boils down those steps. Well, I think that that is a fantastic blueprint and that's everything that you need to thrive and to recover and to renew and to get excited. And also you need a coach. Sometimes you just yeah. don't want to go it alone. Well, yeah, you can read the book, but you know, like we all know what we're not supposed to do, right? I know I'm supposed to drink like 64 ounces of water a day. 
unless I have a little app on my phone that's going, did you drink water yet? <laughs> I'm probably not going to do it, to be honest. So, you know, accountability, support, the, none of this stuff is easy. It's not easy. No, it's, not. it's easy to throw that out there. Oh, you need to forgive, right? right. It's right. not that easy. So you need someone to give you a quick... For yourself. Yeah, forgiveness is for yourself. You know, and right. you can't sit there and dwell on if I could have, would have, should have, because you don't, again, know what's going on in somebody else's mind. But I think that you are just, uh, you're my shero because you've been able to bounce back. You have, you know, you've got four kids. We're sending love and light to your son right now and telling him he is not alone, that, you know, recovery is a sign of strength. And, you know, we're going to send that love and light to your ex-husband, too, that he awakens and he just finds, you know, peace in his life. So tell my brains how to get in contact with you if they're looking for a coach, if they want to purchase a copy of their book. And also, brains, let me tell you, you can win a copy of Fear to Fear, uh, Fearful. Fearful to Fabulous. The <laughs> fabulous. See, got my, it's, all <laughs> it's a lot of X. It's, I like alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> so you can win a copy uh, and also a coffee mug to go with it so that you can get the tea on what's going on. Tell us how to get in contact with you, Fiona. Okay, right. So you can, uh, you know, my book is on Amazon. It'll be out in bookstores in May, but the book is on Amazon. You can go to findfabulouswithfiona.com. So that findfabulouswithfiona.com. You can find out about me there. You can book, I give a free 45 minute call for anybody that would like to look at the challenges they're facing now figure out where they want to be and what is stopping you getting there, right? So you can, that's all on the website. You can find out all of that stuff. If you want to find me on Facebook, it's Fab with Fiona. There's videos on there that you can watch that are um, pretty long, actually, some of them, that will give you ideas for moving on after divorce also. So that's the best way to get me. Right. We have everything that you need here for recovery, for strength, for renewal, for joy, for happiness. And how to stop eating a bag of cookies after a bad, <laughs> a bad relationship right here on the edge. Thank you, Fiona, for being here with us. Keep continuing to work with people and do the things that you do. Uh, and um, I encourage you. And next time you come back, you'll probably be inviting us to the wedding or some nice soiree on a yacht with a new boyfriend. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> All right. So thank you, Brains. Go back, subscribe, not only just watch, but I need you to hook me up on a regular basis so that you can watch what's going on here on The Edge. Other edgy conversations, great conversations in the past and ones to look forward to. Again, thank you so much for being here, Fiona, and come back and visit anytime, darling. Thank you, April. It was lovely to be here. All right. Bye, Brains.